We are going to continue our study of the epistle to the Galatians, Paul's letter to the the Christians in the region of Galatia. And as he's uh, walking with these believers through what it means to really cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ, he at the same time is really pushing back on that which is not the real gospel, not the true gospel. And so we've reached chapter 5 in our study, and as we reach this chapter, we come across this really fascinating subject of freedom. So today and next time, we'll be looking at this, this broader question of what is Christian freedom? What does it entail? What does it not? How does it function? And what does it actually do for the Christian? Besides just the label of free, what does it actually do for us? And so today, we're going to be talking about freedom from sin and freedom from religion. If you have your Bibles open... Uh, I want to invite you to join me in reading from Galatians chapter 5, beginning from verse 1. And brothers and sisters, I'll invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Galatians 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision... Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Father, would you speak to us? Would you bring alive this view that we have of you that would show us a gracious Heavenly Father who condescends to us and who loves us well beyond what our minds can fathom? Humble us today, Lord, and draw us near to yourself, we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Have a seat. A story is told of Louis Delcour, who was a young French soldier during the First World War. He went home for his uh, mandatory leave, and then by mistake, he overstayed his leave. He missed his window to get back to the war. So fearing disgrace, Louis decides to desert the military and the war. He persuades his mother to lock him up in her attic, and she hid him there from everybody and fed him and took care of him for 21 years. But in August of 1937, his mother died. There was no chance now of remaining in hiding, so pale and haggard and afraid, Louis staggered along to the nearest police officer where he gave himself up. The police officer looked at him with utter incredulity and asked him, Where have you been that you had not heard? Haven't heard what? asked Louis. That a law of amnesty for all deserters was passed years ago. Louis had freedom readily available to him. He didn't know. And so he continued to live in a state of slavery, in a state of isolation, and in a state of deprivation. He was stuck. He wasn't free in any sense of the word, and he was terrified at the prospect of being found out. It seems that many Christians, my dear brother and sister, live this way. It seems many of us don't know what we truly have in Christ and what freedom looks like. It seems many of us have a very shallow and a very small understanding of the gospel, or at the very least an incomplete picture of what that gospel does in our lives. We might speak in lofty terms and use big theological words and quote some scripture when we speak about the gospel, but when we ask, what does the gospel do for you? 
I think a lot of us would stagger with the answer. Often what happens when people encounter the gospel of grace is that they think it's too easy. This is why there's so much pushback against Reformed soteriology or Reformed doctrine of salvation. Often when people encounter the gospel of grace, they just think it's not enough. And although we'd never say that, right? Like none of us would ever say, well, it's, it's, it's not quite complete. It's not really the, the whole picture. But man, we sure do live like that. And so then for a lot of Christians, when we think about the gospel of grace and when we think about gr- the fact that grace covers everything all at once, completely, we struggle. And so we go, Jesus plus. Again, this is something that the vast majority of us would never come to admit. This is something that the vast majority of us would be quite uncomfortable with in regular conversation. But for many of us, it's Jesus plus politics. Or Jesus plus a political party. Surely the Christian would vote in this way or this way. For many of us, it's Jesus plus homeschooling. Surely a Christian couldn't allow their child into a public school. For many of us, it's Jesus plus national identity. For many of us, it's Jesus plus abstaining from something. For many of us, it's Jesus plus dressing nicely, being appropriate, being modest. Jesus plus whatever floats your boat. The other option is the no matter what crowd. It's those who think that they're saved by grace and then they go on to live like demons. They'll say, well, I'm saved. It won't change anything. It doesn't matter what I do. Jesus isn't going to forsake me. He's never going to let me go. They might even quote a nice scripture like, nothing will take me out of the palm of his hand. Ultimately, the issue here is that both of these groups push to the extreme and ultimately they lose out on what's going on right here. And that is that what it takes for the Christian to experience genuine Christian joy is a love for Jesus that exceeds everything else. And so what both of these groups do, in effect, is they create a religion for themselves where they can comfortably exist. The Gospel of Christ paints a different picture altogether, my dear friend. And it tells us that the Christian, as we see in our text, is a free person. So what are we set free from? Well, on the one end, it's we're freed from empty religion and mere behavior modification. And on the other end, it's we're free from an empty pursuit of pleasure. You're free from a joyless fear or a joyless duty or a fear. And then you're freed from a mindless self-indulgence or a self-worship. And Paul says in this fascinating way, for freedom you've been set free. Freed from something to something. We get more broadly what we've been freed from. If I ask you, what are you freed from? You'll rattle off a list. I've been freed from condemnation. I've been freed from hell. I've been freed from the wrath of God. I've been freed from death and sin and so on. But Christian, you've also been freed to the freedom of the knowledge of God's love and His faithfulness to you. And that that doesn't waver based on your performance. And if today you're the Pharisee, or today you fall into that sin that you've been fighting for 20 years, God doesn't love you any less. We're scared to speak like that because we think that it pushes us into this bizarre realm of do whatever you want, but the Gospel tells us something different. You're free. You don't need to try to impress God because you're not very impressive. That's what I want us to look at today. Freedom. What does it look like to experience and live in God's freedom? I want to look at our text in two parts. First, the primary focus is going to be on freedom and slavery, and that's going to be followed by obedience and rebellion. Let's take a look at verses 1 through 6 one more time, where I want us to look at freedom and slavery. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. 
you've fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. What's going on here? What's going on in this text? We have freedom, we have slavery, we have circumcision, and Paul, throughout the whole section, is pretty upset about all of it. He's pretty worked up. As you know, through our study of Galatians thus far, there was this religious group that was bothering these new young Galatian believers, these people who had just come to Christ, and they're bothering these people, and they're trying to get them to submit to regulations, and they're trying to tack on things to the gospel that aren't necessary for these believers, that aren't necessary for salvation, that aren't necessary for the Christian life. They're trying to tack things on. They're like, hey, yeah, it's Jesus. We get it. Yeah, we get it. But, come on, every real Christian knows that you also have to do X, Y, and Z. Can you even call yourself a Christian if you don't do X, Y, or Z? And they're doing this to these believers, and Paul is ticked off. Paul is very, very upset at this. And we would think, like, okay, Paul, just let it go. It's fine. It's just, it's like good stuff. It's broadly, it's generally good things that they're being asked to do or not to do. They're being asked to live holier lives and better lives and loftier lives. Leave them alone. They're better off without those things or with those things or whatever. And Paul is angry. Paul is livid. And he's pointing out the fact that this is not the gospel. And the conversation here, specifically in our text, is circling around something that is pretty important to the Jew and to these people who are trying to prompt these these new Galatian believers to live in a way that wouldn't be offensive to them. It's something that these Jews and these, these, uh, these ethnic Jews are really clinging to as a matter of identity and a matter of obvious Christian conduct. And so as they point to this, Paul goes right at the heart of it. So we understand that with, with uh, circumcision, there was this religious right commanded to all of Abraham's descendants in Genesis 17. And this was a sign of God's covenant with them. This is a beautiful thing. This is a sign of God's covenant. This is a sign that God will never let his people go. And then this requirement is repeated to Moses in the Mosaic Law in Leviticus 12. And then throughout history, the Jews, they hung on to this. They continued to practice this religious and by now really a cultural rite. And they've really, it's, it, it persists to today. And it's something that is very prevalent in, in beyond even Jewish uh, culture. But It's something that was very, very important to these people. And while this was something that God did command to Israel, the Jews eventually took it, and they took this thing that in and of itself was a good thing because God never commands anything bad. And he he commands them this good thing, and they take this thing, and they just warp it, and they make it ugly. And the Jews used it uh, as something that would they thought would bring about God's favor. That It's something that would make God look at them with, with more delight, with more favor. It was an external thing, a purely external thing, that they associated with an internal change. And when we hear things like this, Christians, we need to look at our own lives and think, is there something in my life that I'm looking at and I'm giving value to as an internal soul thing that God never did? And so he's challenging these people to look a little bit further And more than holding to the standard themselves, these Jews, these religious Jews start pushing circumcision onto Gentile believers. And they start saying, you can't be a Christian if you don't do this. Paul's issue is not with circumcision at all. Paul's issue is not that circumcision is bad. He's not pushing for that at all. In fact, he did circumcise Timothy so that Timothy could minister in that context among these religious Jews. But there's something behind this push to get the Gentile Christians to take this extra step. And there's something behind trying to get them to keep the ceremonial law. And so Paul says, all right, you want to, you want to go by the law? You want to do the law? You, you, you want out, uh, external conduct and behavior to be the determining marker of how much God loves you? You got to do all of it. You want to go that route? You want to forsake grace? You want to take a step back? And you want to start to identify how mature a Christian is based on them doing this thing or that thing or not doing that thing? you got to do all of it. Be consistent. And Paul is just baffled by all of this. This is just so confusing to him. 
Why would they want to return to trying to earn God's favor and God's forgiveness? Why would they want to return to trying to be accepted by God based on what they've done? And so for Paul, this religion that usurps grace is worse than anything else. Notice in Pauline writings, if you follow through his different letters, if you follow through his ministry, if you follow through how he addresses people, who is Paul angriest with? I'll give you a hint. It's the same people that Jesus was angriest with. It's the religious people who nullify grace and the cross of Christ. He's angrier at these people than he ever is with any sinner. He's angrier with these people than he ever is with any person outside of the church. He's angrier with these people than even the Corinthians. In our mind, it's like, well, that's a religious person just trying to do the right thing. The Corinthians are just living in like all out. It's just insanity in that church. What is wrong with those people? They surely can't be Christians. And Paul is angrier at these religious Jews than he is with the Corinthians. What's going on there? He doesn't tell the Corinthians to go emasculate themselves, but he tells these guys to. If you go the route of religion and you try to go around grace, you will screw up, says Paul. And the thing is, Grace acknowledges the fact that you'll fail and you'll fall short. So on all fronts, grace is so much better. It's so much more beautiful. What are are we going to do? How are we going to impress God? How are we going to get around what Jesus has done? How do you go above that? How do you overshoot Him? There are two ways to go about the Christian faith, Paul says. You can become a slave and you can work for God, or you can become a child and you can enjoy living in his presence. You can enjoy his fellowship. You can enjoy his favor freely. A slave tries to perform and win favor with the master. A slave tries to impress their master. A slave is always wondering, is this good enough? Is he mad at me? Am I okay? Is this today, is today the day that he's going to smack me upside the head? And the thing is that slaves are always unsure that they've done enough to please the master. They never really know where they stand. Slaves live with an air of anxiety about them. Slaves can never rest. Slaves are always wondering what's wrong with me. Why doesn't he like me? A child knows that apart from his own accomplishments, his name is in the will. They're already a son They're already a daughter. They can rest in that peace and the love that comes with that identity. Friends, do you realize how much more beautiful that is than trying to impress Him? He doesn't want you to impress Him. Look with me at Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. Just go back to the previous chapter. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Paul is saying, why would you go back? Why would you go back? Live in the freedom of sonship. Enjoy it. Revel in it. Paul says that if you want to work for your salvation, if you want to impress God, Jesus won't work for it. He's of no advantage to you. He's not going to go in for you. You want to earn it? Best of luck. But Christ is an advantage to us. He freed us. He paid for us. He made us his children and he does us only good unless we want to do the work for him. Unless we want to earn our way, then he's going to back off and he's going to leave you to it. Grace is given freely to those who will live by grace. But if you shove grace aside and you try to do the work yourself, you're cut off. Rest in grace. Why would we ever go another way? So why is this even an issue? None of this is controversial, right? None of this should trip any of us up. 
Like, this seems kind of obvious. Of course it's grace. Of course this is the way that we go. But for the legalist, the one who wants to work their way to favor with God, grace makes them angry. Grace confuses the legalist. Grace, or, grace is something that's bizarre for the legalist because the legalist is always trying to find the next step to take, the next thing to do. Just consider the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Jesus tells this parable of a father with two sons. One of them wants his inheritance right away because he just wants to go party and he wants to go live his life. And then he goes and he takes that money and he squanders all of it and he lives recklessly. He indulges in sin. He lives a depraved life. And then he's just at the rock bottom. And he, he comes to his senses when he's at that low point and he's like, I, I, ha- I have to beg for mercy. I can't do this. And so he goes and he begs for mercy from his father and before he can even get to the father's house, the father comes running to him. And he greets him with grace and love and forgiveness and he gives him gifts and he throws him a party and he celebrates that my son is home. But the older brother, the one who stayed with the father, the one who faithfully continued to do the very thing that was asked of him, the one who didn't disobey, the one who didn't go off and live in sin, the one who didn't compromise, the one who didn't cross the line, the one who didn't live in Christian gray zones, he's angry. He looks at the son and he looks at the father in confusion and he can't wrap his head around it and he refuses to go and celebrate the fact that his brother has been saved. And the father, instead of pointing to him and judging him, he goes to the legalist, just like he went to the prodigal. And he goes and pursues him. And he encourages him to come and celebrate the love that he has given to his brother and the fact that his brother is alive. Grace makes the legalist think, well, that can't be right. Surely not that person. Surely not the one living like that. Look at what they do. Look at what they don't do. I've been better. I've done more. But do you remember how Jesus came to even tell this parable? Jesus tells this parable in response to him sitting with tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees being mad at him. And what does Jesus not do? He doesn't justify himself. He doesn't explain why he's with these people. He doesn't give them the what and the why. He doesn't try to justify the fact that he's here to save these people. What he does is he tells them about grace. And he tells them that the father comes running to the sinner to get his son. Friend, what is your view of God? How do you relate to him? Which one do you lean towards? How do we understand this God who comes and gets these people that don't deserve it and gives them everything and asks for nothing in return? How, how, how do we picture that? Are, are you fearfully and awkwardly still navigating that relationship, hoping to please him? Or are you a son? Do you know what it means to receive grace and mercy? Do you feel like you still need to do something to stay in his favor? Well, God is telling you he wants something else. Paul here points to an interesting aspect of of the Christian life. As he's talking about these things and as he's challenging us to not fall into one extreme or the other, he points to this other aspect of the Christian life, and that is waiting. He says specifically that we wait for the hope of righteousness. Notice, this, this is not a present reality, but a hope. We can't have perfect righteousness in this life. We're broken people. We still sin. We still fail. We fall short. Our life is a life of hoping and waiting. In Romans 8, we see that our broken bodies groan as they wait for renewal. And so in this text, Paul is saying, so do our souls groan for God's completed work of sanctification. We trust and we hope and we believe that he'll finish the good work that he began in us. We cannot be perfect in this life. And Paul is saying, if you're not ready to do the whole thing, stop thinking that you'll please God by doing X and Z, but skipping Y. Stop pushing other people to a standard that God doesn't call them to. Paul then says, to wrap this thought up in the sixth verse, 
that this thing that is sort of at the center of this discussion, that's at the center of this argument, this thing that can be seen as a good thing, that can be understood as a righteous thing to do, this thing, circumcision, counts for nothing. It does nothing. Circumcision, uncircumcision, doesn't matter. But what, wait, what? Paul, but, it, but it's good, right? Like, like it's, it's good to do this thing, right? It's, it's good to dress this way. It's good to talk this way. It's good to do this and not do that. It's good to not go here and go there, right? It shows biblical fidelity. It shows wisdom. It makes sense for the cultural context, right, Paul? It counts for nothing. Think about what he's saying. This is so important. Circumcision. You can see this as an outward external action, even with good intentions. Doesn't matter for how God sees you. Faith through love. That's what God wants. Faith working through love. If we consider the fact, Christian, if you consider the fact that God looks at you right now, present reality, with delight and with love and with acceptance, he's not looking at you waiting for that day when you'll be a little bit better before he does that. He's not looking at some future version of you before he does that. But he looks at you now as you are, frail, doubting, failing, questioning your faith maybe, but pressing forward. And if you believe that that's how God looks at you, this is where we get the motivation and the strength and the endurance to press forward in holy living and in fleeing from sin and in giving things up for his sake. It's not from doing those things in order to obtain his love, but it is when I understand that even when I don't, for some reason he still loves me, that's when I get the motivation to look at my life and say, I can't live this way. I can't dishonor the one who gave himself for me. I can't push back against the grace that he has freely given me. It becomes so much easier then to produce that joy in our hearts because it's from Him and it's for Him. It's the one who loves me. It's the one who came and got me. It's the one who won't ever abandon me. Of course, my whole life is His. That, beloved, is freedom. And we'll study this in the next portion of, the, of this, this chapter, but it's that freedom to freely give things up. It's that freedom to not hold on to whatever I feel like I've accomplished. It's that freedom to live the life that God actually calls me to as opposed to the one that I've conjured up in my head. And finally, we get to the latter portion of our text, verses 7 through 12, where we'll look at obedience and rebellion. In the latter section of our text, Paul says this interesting thing. He, he looks at these people who he's, he's really, you know, he, he, he's telling them, he's sort of chastising them, like, who, who fooled you? Who, who lied to you? You guys, I can't believe you fell for this. And he looks at them and he says, you were doing well. You were doing well. Let's reread these, these verses from 7 to 12. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. He says, you're doing well. And what is it that got in the way of their obedience? What is it that, that messed them up along the way? What ruined your good track record? What threw you off course? It was this belief that obedience is what drives me into God's love. It's that understanding that by doing the right thing, I'll finally be accepted. I'll finally be looked at with love. He's not saying don't obey. There's plenty of Pauline writings where Paul is calling for obedience, for holy living, for fleeing from sin, from giving things up, from running from the things of this world, from building a life that centers around Christ and for the good of others. There's plenty of that. But what Paul is saying here is 
your obedience and your striving for holiness becomes joyful and ceases to be burdensome when you stop seeing it as a duty necessary to please God. When you stop seeing it as a duty to make him love you, to appear more holy before others, to look better in the context of ministry. This is not the gospel of grace. Duty-bound, Christians, uh, duty-bound Christian living is miserable. It, it's miserable. You'll always feel weighed down. You'll always feel incomplete. You'll always feel like you haven't quite reached it. And worse still is it misrepresents Christ. Duty-bound Christian living misrepresents the one who paid the whole price and who took on all of God's wrath for me. We're being pointed to the fact that obedience and rebellion might look different than many of us initially thought. We think rebellion is that outward, external, clear going into the world and going into sin, but Paul is actually pointing out by speaking of the adverse of obedience in this text is that you are being rebellious if you try to tack things on to the gospel, if you try to tack things on to the grace of Christ. Rebellion and disobedience could happen by way of well-intentioned deeds, but with the wrong motivation. Paul says that that's not obedience. And then looking at verses 9 through 12, Paul gets very, very serious here. He speaks of something that really should make us pause and think very, very seriously about what we're doing here as a a church, what this is all about. When he says a little leaven, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, he's saying it won't take much. It's not going to take a lot to ruin everything that's beautiful right here. It's, it's not going to be a lot. It's not going to be that somebody comes in here and starts, you know, selling drugs and doing whatever else. It's, it's not going to take much. It's just going to take a little bit of extra religion tacked onto the gospel and it ruins everything. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Just a little bit of, do this. Just a little bit of, uh, why don't we add that in? Robs us of the joy and the beauty of God's grace. And what it does is it exchanges love for fear. Because then, slowly but surely, we start to kind of grow from that and change from that and become a little bit different and a little bit different and then our expectations go higher and higher and higher. If you study any false movement, if you study any cult, it always starts really well-intentioned. I'm, I'm pretty fascinated by cults. I'm fascinated by these weird religious movements. And it always starts with some good intention. And sometimes like a little bit of a a variation in, in, in the exegesis of a certain biblical passage, you know, majoring on the minors kind of a deal, but it always starts well-intentioned. And Paul says, it'll ruin it. Those good intentions don't mean anything if it's tacking something onto the gospel. We ought to be very, very careful with what we say should or shouldn't be a part of the Christian life, what is or isn't expected of the man or woman of God. We're constantly in danger, friends, of leaning into one of two extremes. Either do this or, ah, don't worry about that. And we desperately need the leading of the Holy Spirit to help protect us. This is something we don't talk all that much about. What does it mean to be a spirit-led Christian when it comes to making a decision? What does it mean to be a spirit-led Christian when it comes to thinking about my convictions and deepening my resolve in biblical uh, and an understanding of what the Bible asks of me? As spirit-led Christians, we push into that understanding of what it means to understand the mind of God and what it means to understand the expectations of God for us and not to tack things onto him. We need that leading so badly. The way of Christ, the way of grace, is the way which makes us much, much, much less the center and leans way more into him, into his work, into his promises. Grace decreases us, and it exalts him. And when we're smaller and he's bigger, That's the point at which changing something about my lifestyle, changing something about my thinking, changing something about the way that I relate to others, it becomes so much more natural because my life is him. It's not me. And when we fail, either by way of legalism or kind of going the opposite direction of what's known as antinomianism, which is like, yeah, do whatever, it doesn't matter. When we go either way, we get to stand in awe of the gospel. Because guess what? Both the Pharisee and the prodigal son need Jesus. 
And they both need God's grace and mercy. Friend, when we fail, not if, when we fail, we don't catch him off guard. But the Father tells us that he still loves us and he will still run after us. Both the prodigal and the Pharisee. And he will still love us and he will still patiently lead us. And then as Paul wraps up this thought at the, at the end of, of this section, he really graphically goes on to say that going the way of the law is impossible. It's completely, completely impossible. It does no good, and relying on these external acts is an act of futility. You might as well just scrap the whole system. The attempt is pointless. You know, friends, the, one of the things, I haven't been a believer for as long as many of you, but I've been walking with the Lord for a little over 12 years, something like that. I've been around churches for a long time. I grew up in church. I I've, I've grew up hearing the gospel, but I didn't repent in my stupidity and stubbornness until later on in life. But one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is the fact that God works in ways that we just absolutely don't expect him to. We just, this is, the way that God regularly goes about saving people and getting getting his, his gospel preached and growing churches, it's, it's the way that we would never expect him to. He doesn't use the powerful. He doesn't use the mighty. He doesn't use the one that you would expect him to use. He doesn't use the righteous. The one who accomplished something. He draws sinners to himself. He draws broken, frail people to himself. He uses weak people. And he accomplishes amazing things. He just does the biggest things. It's not him working. Or I'm sorry, it's not, it's not us working. It's him working in us. It's not that we come in and we start kind of shifting things around and we grew this church and we made this ministry look a certain way and we presented the truth in this way and that's why that person got saved. No, it's God working in us. It's God working in these frail people. And you just go back to early church history and you go back to this understanding of what happened when the, the church grew, when Christianity grew, and you look at the, those saints. And we like to think that like, oh man, these were like these you know, big people, these exalted people. Yeah, sure, the apostles were, but they were 12 guys in the church. What God used was brand new converts, no training, not even a Bible in hand, no, they, they weren't really, uh, they didn't really have anything to offer. These were brand new pagan converts or religious Jewish converts. These were people who, by all accounts, were not the well-to-do of society. And he uses these people to work mightily through them and to, to make sure that his gospel gets to the whole world. And he's, he gets it to every country. And he spreads these people out and fearless and bold, these poor peasants from the ancient Near Eastern world go and they gladly die for Jesus. And then somebody watching this is just bowled over and they're like, what's up? what's up with these people? What's wrong with them? And then one by one, the gospel starts to spread forth. It's not the way that we would have done it. It's not a great business strategy. They preached the truth. They acted on his behalf and they showed Christ-likeness in their lives. And God used that. So it is today. Friend, God doesn't need us to make up the difference and add to his work. It's his spirit that works in you and makes you more like Christ. It's his spirit that grows you and makes you a more effective tool in his hand. Now none of this is an excuse to not pursue holy living. I hope you're hearing me correctly. This is not an excuse to go and live however you want. This is not an excuse to not fight sin. If you're not fighting sin, if you're not pursuing holiness, you're showing by that aspect of your life that you don't care about the things of God. God is pushing us into the middle of these extremes and he's showing us that one and the other are actually a really beautiful relationship when they work together. Rather, what God is prompting us to is a deeper understanding of grace and a more beautiful picture of what he's doing and he's trying to give us a better idea, a clearer idea of how the Father views his children. As we wrap our minds around all of this, let us consider one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture together. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It isn't me living this life. 
It's not about me. It's Christ in me. Friends, this is justification by faith and then sanctification by faith. When we understand what we have in sonship, when we understand what it means to be freed from the yoke of slavery, when we understand the identity that God has bestowed upon you when he saved you and how he looks at you now through the work of Jesus, the fact that you're accepted, the fact that you're loved, that's when we can let go of anxiety and fear and uncertainty and doubt and all the things that come with thinking that I still need to do something. And that's when we can start living free, rich, happy, spirit-filled, and spirit-led lives. And that's when the world looks at the joy of the Christian and asks, why do you have that hope? May God grant us strength to live like that. Amen. Would you bow your heads for a moment, friends? I'm going to give you just a minute in the quiet of your heart to talk to God about these things. The way that each of us is wired is different. Some of us veer to one extreme or the other. Some of you are much better at being in the middle of these things that we're talking about than, than some of us. But talk to God about these things. Ask him to revive this, this love for him, this love for the gospel, to give you a greater picture of the grace of God today. I'll give you a minute, and then I'll, I'll close this in prayer. Our great God, we come before you acknowledging, like the words of that hymn, that we are prone to wander. Lord, we rely so heavily on that which you have never called us to rely upon. Father, I ask for your forgiveness for the ways that I have been arrogant. I ask for your forgiveness for the ways that I have gone around the gospel of grace. And I ask that you would extend even more grace to all of us as we seek to live these lives that you have called us to. Lord, I can't even wrap my mind around the immensity of that beauty that you look upon me with all of my shortcomings and failings and you call me son. Lord, help us all individually, as Christians, and as a body seeking to grow up into him who is the head, let us all lean heavily onto that truth that you have done everything necessary for our salvation and that you love us and that you accept us so that we might be free to live those lives that would truly represent Jesus to a world that so desperately needs to see him in the lives of Christians, and hear him from their lips. Help us, God. Please. Amen.